Hello. Um, I'm very happy for this opportunity to uh, present my research in, in more of a sound studies context, I suppose. Uh, and thank you very much for to Phil for inviting me. Um, before moving on um, to, to audiobooks, I want to take a moment, and Phil already uh, introduced me very uh, nicely, uh, but I wanted to say a little bit about myself and my way into this field, uh, because I, how, I, how I approach uh, audiobooks and audio storytelling is, of course, very much uh, shaped by my disciplinary background. Uh, I did my PhD in literary studies in Denmark and now hold a position as as, as Phil said, a senior lecturer in publishing studies and digital cultures. And my research sort of focuses on the intersection between those fields. So I'm interested in how media and formats shape literature, uh, shape how we read and, and write books and tell stories, basically. Uh, I've written a book on intermedia literature, so focusing mostly on the interactions between text and image uh, and what happens to printed books, book culture in a digital age. And then I've written about serialization um, and what we call transmedia storytelling. So how stories, how literary works develop across um, platforms. And then I've moved on to the audio format. And for the past years, I've focused on audiobooks and what I call audio literature. Um, so I'm, I'm rather new in a sound studies context and, and look very much forward to talking to you about what that perspective might also add to, to my research. My plan today is that I'm first going to outline kind of a background or context for my, for my studies. Um, so why should we talk about audiobooks uh, now? Uh, also touching uh, upon the history of, of the format. Uh, and then I'm going to say something about my approach and what I want to know. Um, and that has to do with partly the uses uh, of the format, how the audio format shapes how we experience and use uh, books. Um, so I'm going to talk about that, about listeners and especially this aspect of mobility, uh, mobile listening. And then in the second part of the lecture, I'm moving on uh, more towards the, the content and the actual the sound dimension um, of audiobooks. And I'm going to finish, if, the, if, there's, if there's time, with, with a case study, this audio production of George Orwell's 1984. Um, so why uh, are we talking about, why should we talk about audiobooks? Um, as some of you probably know, um, audiobooks have become very popular in recent years, uh, especially here in Scandinavia. Uh, and at least in my world, in, in the publishing uh, world, we often speak of the format as, as something new, which is also very much connected to, the, to digitalization. People in sound studies probably know better as recorded uh, audio stories. Sound study st stories have a long history, uh, and the history of audiobooks to some extent also uh, runs parallel uh, to that of other audio narratives, such as uh, audio drama, of course, uh, radio. Um, but contrary to audio drama, uh, audiobooks have always been very strongly connected to book culture and also very much always compared to the printed book. Mat Matthew Rubery, um, who wrote this one, uh, The Untold Sto Story of the Talking Book, uh, traces the format back to the invention of the phono phonograph in the 19th century, where we have recordings of poetry as some of the very first uh, sound recordings. Um, and since uh, then, the story of the audiobook has, has very much been connected uh, also to the history of disability. Uh, Rubery describes how uh, the development of, of, uh, of audiobooks and audiobook production has been connected to uh, broader uh, historical development. So, for instance, audiobook production increased um, after the world wars to accommodate the needs of, of soldiers returning home after the, the war and uh, have, having lost their eyesight. Also, audiobooks have been strongly connected to children's entertainment. So we probably all have some, some kind of memories of, of listening to books as, as children. But, but um, it's never really been seen as equal to the printed book. It was always more of a secondary mediator uh, and something for those who could not read uh, rather than, than a format in its own uh, right. However, one, what, however, that might be 
changing. Uh, as Ruberry also states here, listening to audiobooks is one of the only types of reading that has grown in popularity. Um, so he says that in, in, in 2016, and it's it's only been going increasing even more uh, since. Um, and that might also be affecting, of course, the uses and the status of the format. So during the last, last decade, we have seen sort of a strong increase in the number of people listening to audiobooks. Uh, and as the numbers of listeners increases, so does, of course, also uh, audiobook sales and the number of titles being produced in the format. So the audiobook has gone from being something of a minor thing and almost kind of an afterthought in, in the publishing process uh, to constituting a significant part of the book market. So this development is an international phenomenon. We see the top figure here, um, which, um, uh, which depicts the development in audiobook sales uh, kind of, of globally. Uh, so we see the increase very clearly uh, during the past years. But it should also be mentioned how it's, it's very much uh, a development that is very strong in, in Scandinavia. So the figure uh, um, down, down there is from the Swedish Publishers Association, uh, showing how the number of printed books, uh, the sales numbers have been going uh, down in recent years, and the number of streamings in the book uh, streaming services, which is primarily audiobooks, have, have gone up uh, at the same time. And also for comparison's sake, it may be uh, relevant to note how audiobooks or these streamings, they constitute about 28.5% of the Swedish book market, while in the UK it's just 7-8%. Um, so Sweden and Scandinavia in general are very strong on audiobooks, which partly has to do with the fact that we have some very digitally savvy populations. People have kind of embraced the digital audiobook format. And also we have some very strong Scandinavian actors, such as the streaming service Storytel, which has been leading in, in the development uh, of the format. More broadly, it's, it's safe to say that the audiobook's recent popularity has, to, has a lot to do with the digital format, which makes it possible to listen to audiobooks through mobile phones with a, lot, with a couple of headphones and accessing any number of books through a streaming service. So the digital format and the smartphone and the streaming model very much affects how we use uh, audiobooks. Ibn Hale and Birgitte Stoker Pedersen write about that in, in this um, digital audiobooks, uh, their book, um, about how the digital format makes audiobooks fit into modern everyday life, leading to new uses and experiences. So people are able to listen while they do other things, commuting, exercising, cooking, as we also see in these commercials for audiobook services. So listening is the new reading. Uh, it says here in this one uh, up there from Audible, um, as you can listen anywhere and anytime. Um, and the Danish commercial says, listen and go and continue reading in the sofa. So the values that we see associated with audiobooks has to do with flexibility and mobility and also accessibility. Through the streaming services, you get unlimited access to a large number of titles. Um, so these are all values that make them fit very well into contemporary sort of middle-class everyday life, as we also see represented in those commercials. So the idea here is that, 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 that this development that we see, the audiobook boom, it very much has to do with uh, some broader changes in digital culture. The pandemic should, of course, also be mentioned, 2020 and 2021, were like record years when it came to audiobook sales. Uh, and in our surveys uh, and so on, people very often mention how they started listening to audiobooks during, uh, when they were isolated at home, uh, during lockdown periods and so on. So that definitely kind of spurred on um, the development, but the audiobook boom is also part of some broader tendencies which, which could be observed even before the pandemic. And on that note, uh, it should also be related to some broader developments, a, a turn towards orality and orality. Uh, John B. Thompson, a publishing uh, studies researcher, refers to the audiobook boom as the new orality. And that makes me make the connection to, to these kind of broader tendencies in relating to more other forms of audio storytelling. 
So we often today speak of a podcasting revolution. And for instance, uh, this book here on, on podcasting uh, linked that to what it calls new oral uh, culture. And of course, you should also, you should always be careful uh, talking about new turns. But I think it's, it's safe to say that uh, this audiobook uh, boom that we see, it, it can be linked to the so-called podcast revolution and more broadly, a culture of mobile uh, listening, or what sound study scholar Michael Bull also calls the iPad, iPod culture back in 20, 20, 2007. So the idea that people like to listen and also tend to combine listening with other activities, moving around with something in their ears, uh, basically. And I'll get back to that and what it means for audiobooks and for reading specifically. And of course, the notion of new, a new orality also refers to Walter Ong, who wrote this uh, seminal book on um, orality and literacy. So basically, he argues that the development from oral culture to a culture based on writing, based on literacy, impact how we think, impact society at a very broad level and, of course, in a historical perspective. So now we see this turn towards orality in a culture which is, of course, still uh, very much based on writing and on literacy. But one could claim that it relates to what Ong calls a secondary orality. So specifically, if you looked at uh, audio books or audio drama and even uh, podcasts, uh, we have a form of orality or oral performance which is still very much based on uh, writing and on some kind of a script. So that's a kind of a secondary orality. So this is sort of the broader background or context um, for, for, for why I'm interested in audiobooks. Uh, and it leads me, me to some of the questions that I would like to explore. Uh, I'm basically interested in how all these developments, how they impact uh, not only how we read, uh, but also how we write and tell stories. Um, so that is uh, both the users, but also the aesthetics and the narrative content of the text that we listen to. And ulti ultimately, I'm interested in discussing what all that does to the concept of literature, so which has historically been very much shaped by the notion of the printed book. So could we think of literature as something that also includes audio narratives, a uh, story written for audio only, uh, e perhaps even literary podcasts, audio walks, and so on. Um, yeah, and I'm not finished with that. So what I really want to, to stress in this lecture is, is, um, is perhaps mostly the two first questions and also the relation between them, so how we read or how we think we are reading when we listen to audiobooks. Um, all of the notions that are listed before, the ideas of mobility and so on, how does that also impact the kind of stories that we tell and how we tell those stories? And basically that also has to do with my broader interest in, in the connection between aesthetics and developing media and formats, but also the social and commercial context or conditions of those media. So rather than, than just trying to say that the format, that the audiobook in this case is sort of determine, sort of determines the content, the kind of text that we read or how we read them, uh, I want to sort of look at the interplay between those different factors or actors. So the readers and the ideas about reading associated with audiobooks, as well as the producers and the aesthetic content and so on. And related to that, just a few words on my overall approach. So I'm trying to combine an interest in aesthetics uh, from literary studies and perhaps also sound studies, but more specifically from the field of audio narratology, which will allow me to say something about the aesthetics and basically how to use sound and the combination of sound and text to tell stories. But then, of course, I'm also interested as a publishing studies scholar in the book part of audiobooks. So I combine this with aspects from publishing studies and the sociology of literature to study audiobooks and audiobook readers as indeed as readers and as part of book culture. And, of, and then, of course, I want to study this in relation to broader commercial, social and media context. So I'm also drawing on perspective from media and cultural studies. Well, uh, I want to begin uh, with the perspective of reading because that is what we most often talk about when we talk about audiobooks. Uh, and I included some headlines here just to illustrate the kind of debate that is going on um, 
it's very much about comparing listening to audiobooks to reading print. Uh, it's is it really reading? How is it different from reading print and so on? And I'm not going to go into that discussion too much, but I wanted to bring it up here because these debates very much shape the idea of audiobooks or listening to audiobooks that also eventually come to shape many of the text or the works that we see are being produced for audio. So we have this idea that listening to audiobooks is somehow lesser than reading print, and there's also, there are also some strong associations with a kind of distracted reading. Uh, this, of course, has to do with the fact that, as I mentioned before, that audiobooks are often used in combination with other things. Um, so if you uh, listen while you do housework or while you ride your bike, can you really be fully concentrated on the text? Uh, and, of course, between the lines here, there's... Uh, the ideal is, is a kind of absorbed reading with the book in the center, so to speak. So some kind of, not, not as some kind of background music to other activities. There's really an ideal that the, the, the text should be in, in, at the center. So this debate is very much about audiobooks as books or how they are not books. It's very much uh, about what they are not basically. And I think that by moving a bit away from the bookish context and perhaps discussing uh, this from more of a sound or media studies perspective, it might be possible to say more about what the audiobooks actually are and, and what, what, what it is, um, both, both what it does both to the to users and the text. Um, so I want to try to say something about what the more specific affordances of the audiobook format uh, uh, do in part to the reading or the experience of the text and, and also to the text themselves. And by affordances, I mean kind of the properties, the possibilities and limitations associated with the format. More specifically, I'm going to say something about mobility because this lecture is called Books on the Move and I did promise Phil to say something about mobile listening. And I think the mobility part is quite central in, in, in the audiobook experience today. It's something that many listeners uh, emphasize when we ask them why they listen to audiobooks. Uh, and I think it's also interesting to, sc to discuss what the idea of listening to stories on the go, what it does to the kind of stories that we, that we write and, and tell. So I'll say something about that. And then, of course, a very central part of audiobooks is the very mediation through sound and the, the audio dimension of audiobooks. What does that add to the listener experience and how could it potentially shape or reshape a literary work or just or just a work. Um, so first, uh, mobility, what does the mobility of the audio format, uh, what does it do to the listener experience? And the fact that we can listen yeah, while we move around in the world. Uh, I'm, quote, I'm quoting uh, Michael Bull here, who emphasizes how listening frees up the eyes to observe and to imagine. So quite literally, you can actually look at your surroundings while you are move, move, while you are listening to books. Uh, the text becomes a flow of sound. He also says the sound print of the book is imposed on the silence of the world of the world around the listener. So the world goes silent, according to Bull, as we listen to books. We might connect that to the idea of, uh, we might connect that to, to Bull's uh, sort of overall argument concerning mobile listening, and particularly this idea that people today are moving around in some kind of uh, sound bubbles when using their headphones um, and, and mobile uh, digital devices, where they sort of listen to books or music and podcasts. Um, and this, this kind of means that they are somehow become attached from the social and physical, uh, de detached from the social and physical surroundings. So we are free to observe, but at the same time, it seems we are kind of also apart from the world that we are observing, observing. Which is interesting because with this in mind, it would seem that while from the perspective of literary studies or reading studies, the audiobook becomes very much associated with a distraction from the text. We can't concentrate on the text because we move around doing other things. But from this perspective, uh, we are kind of distracted from the world and from the surroundings because we are all up in the book. 
Um, it would seem that the audiobook can't really make anybody happy uh, because according to these ideas, we are neither focused on the book and we are not present in the world, uh, roughly speaking. Uh, but it's also possible to complicate that a little bit. So these ideas, again, looking more on what audiobooks adds uh, to, to the experience and less focusing on what it takes away from literary experience. Uh, Lutz Köpnik has written a lot about the idea of reading on the move and emphasizes how the format may promote some kind of interaction, a kind of resonance, as he called it, between the, the text and the surroundings, what he calls resonant reading. So he writes, uh, audio literature transforms books into matters of the world. It endows them with a form of agency not so different from the ones our strolling subject might claim for his own life. To read attentively for him, therefore, means to negotiate, to bring into play and calibrate the coexistence of different material forces, wills, and agential powers. It means not to develop stunning interpretations or deep structural analysis, but to learn how to live with and embed audible sound in space and across time. So Kipnik does not really object to the, object to the idea that listening to audiobooks might be distracting, or that listeners might be distracted from the text, but rather that the distraction itself may add something to the reading experience. Um, so according to him, there is something to be gained by reading or listening at the edges of attention, as he also writes. Rather than concentrating on the text and developing these deep structural analysis, uh, so rather than placing the text at the center, uh, so um, this kind of resonant reading would focus on the interplay between the text and the listener and the surroundings. By having uh, the text and the audiobook as some kind of background music, it becomes possible to consider the text as context uh, for other experiences and for, for, for instance, the experience of the physical surroundings or the activities that we are engaged in. Um, of course, Kipnik writes very much, he writes at a theoretical level. Uh, in some of my own research, I've tried to look more closely, more empirically perhaps into this, how people actually uh, use and experience audiobooks. So recently I did a big um, survey with a colleague where we asked uh, 1400 Swedish audiobook users uh, uh, why they listen to audiobooks. And in this survey we see how the aspect of mobility and the idea of listening while doing something else become very central. Uh, it's a very large majority of the respondents who emphasize these aspects, how they listen while they do something else. And these are just some quotes from the survey in Swedish, unfortunately. But as I mentioned, many people emphasize the aspect of mobility, of multitasking, and sort of the practical dimension of audiobook consumption. But others also emphasize a matter, the matter of aesthetic experience. A lot of listeners note how the listening to audiobooks guilts its for Jülla. Uh, their surroundings. So we might uh, again see this idea of resonance, so the text resonating with the surroundings. And some people also emphasize how the format and specifically the audio aspect, the sound and the performance add something to the text, uh, to the literary experience. And this is of course all about audio books in general. Uh, to say more about this kind of interplay between text and context, text and surroundings, we might need to focus on some specific texts. Um, so moving on to the text then, uh, or the content. Uh, um, we do see works which kind of actively try to work with the idea of resonant reading and this interplay between text and context. So for instance, working with DPS technologies uh, to trace the listener's movement to make a story which sort of works creatively with the listeners' surroundings, the situated reading experience. So there was a big research project at Bath Spa University, among other things, on this, what they call ambient uh, literature. So that would be something like uh, what you know from an audio guide, but related to a fictional story. So you move around and listen to a story that actually takes place in your actual surroundings, moving around in London, for instance, or Copenhagen. Uh, and we do see experiments with this kind of play-specific stories. Uh, so working with promoting what you might call a situated reading experience. Of course, these texts are still quite experimental. It's kind of the avant-garde of audio 
uh, narratives. In my own research, uh, I focused more on kind of the more mainstream stories because I'm in publishing studies, so we're also interested in what what are what is the the big tendencies. And I focus on so-called uh, born audio uh, narratives, so that is literary text produced specifically for the audiobook format, and how they might also to some extent be working with the mobility or this place-specific aspect. Specifically, I focused on the case of Storytel Originals. So these are born audio narratives produced by the streaming service uh, Storytel, and this is how they are described on on, their, on Storytel's website. Uh, a Storytel Original is a story written to fit the audio format. This means that you, the listener, can easily follow along with the story even when you are on the go in everyday life. So they quite uh, literally emphasize how the story is adjusted for mobile consumption, reading on the go and during everyday activities. So what does that mean, you might ask, for the stories being told? At first glance, it means that we get some very simple stories. Uh, this is a quote from an interview with a storyteller editor about how they instruct uh, their authors to write for the audio format. And she says, few characters, plenty of dialogue, a forward-leaning storytelling, shorter and simpler depictions of things, no embroidering, many external threats, stories that are pushed forward due to events in the plot, not due to what characters feel. In a monologue and the similar are we not particularly interested in. The simpler and more eventful, the better. So this, of course, sort of reflects the general idea that the audiobook listener is distracted, uh, mobile listening is distracted listening, and therefore mobile stories are, are, are simple stories, uh, easy to follow even when on the go in everyday life. And this basically confirms some very established idea about audiobooks and also what about what audiobook listeners are like. One example of this kind of, uh, of, of storytelling original is the series uh, Virus, Virus by the Swedish author Daniel Åberg. It was published in 2016 uh, to 2020, so it was one of their first uh, real born audio uh, serials that Storytel launched, and it became very popular. Uh, in many ways, it's, it's an example of a very successful born audio story, and it's a good example of the strategy uh, that I mentioned before. It's very plot-driven, there's a lot of action, a lot of dialogue, a lot of cliffhangers too. But I want, I'm focusing on it here because it's also an example of how the aspect of mobility or this place specificity uh, can be applied to even this kind of, of text. So the story in, in Virus takes place in Stockholm. A deadly pandemic breaks out and almost everybody dies. And then the story follows the few survivors. And the reason I bring it up here is there's a lot of emphasis on places in this text. So detailed descriptions of well-known sites and places in Stockholm, clearly speaking to someone Swedish uh, who is familiar with these places. And it's kind of playing with the, with the place specificity as a part of the, post, the whole post-apocalypse uh, concept, so turning these familiar places unfamiliar so after the pandemic. Uh, so so um, what I'm getting at here in this case is the way this text is written and adjusted for audio, it also implies that it's adjusted for a very specific uh, geographical context to promote this kind of a place-specific reading experience. We see a listener uh, comment commenting on that here, how it becomes for him almost like an audio guide to his hometown. It adds a dimension to the, to the experience for the story taking place in a familiar setting. Uh, and that's something we see in, in many of those bone audio stories by Storyteller, a very, a very strong emphasis on places, on geographical descriptions. Uh, and I would relate that potentially to the idea of mobile reading, because even though we don't know where these stories are, where the listening actually takes place, there is an idea of the listener as somebody on the move and moving around and watching uh, the surroundings while listening. So there's an idea that places matter here. And that's also emphasized when these uh, stories are translated, which they are to a great extent because they are produced by this tran transnational streaming service. So usually they are translated, uh, a lot of them are translated for the different storytelling markets. And when they are translated, their whole settings are also changed. So for instance, the Dutch version uh, of this virus series is plays out in Amsterdam instead of Stockholm. 
So different versions take place in different cities with different, but, but also with, with different characters with different names. So for instance, that the, the Dutch version has Dutch names and the Turkish version has Turkish names and so on. So in that sense too, these originals are also moving stories. They are sort of moving across markets and, and sort of culturally adjusted for those markets. So signifying the producer's idea that born audio stories, they have to be uh, to some extent place specific. Okay, so now I talked about uh, mobility a lot and how the mobile format impact the listening and as well as the kind of text that we write uh, for sound. But I haven't talked a lot about the actual sound part of or, or the audio part of audiobooks. And I want to say something about that for the last part of the lecture. So traditionally audiobooks have been quite, the audiobook producers have been quite conservative when it comes to how the format is used. There's been this idea that audiobooks should not be too, the perfor performances should not be too dramatized. The performance should be as neutral as possible to provide an experience as close to real reading uh, as possible. And of course, no music, no sound effects, and so on. So the reader should be able to imagine the story for herself. Uh, this is the kind of ideology that we have, that's quite common and among uh, publishers, and, and uh, of course also because that's, to some extent, it's also what the listeners want. But we have seen this, uh, but as we have seen this audiobook boom, uh, as the format gets more popular and also as it sort of gets increasingly taken serious as a format in its own right, we do also see more experimentation. Um, producers who want to explore the possibilities uh, in the audio format and to tell stories in new ways and working with the possibilities in mediating through sound. So for instance, we see more books with music, uses of voice dramatization, multiple voices, uh, sound effects. For instance, uh, we get sound of rain, of walking in the snow and, and so on in, in books. Um, so these on the slide is just some examples uh, and most of them are what we might call hybrids, uh, sort of genre hybrids. We have a graphic novel audio by Leigh Badugo. Uh, there's an audio serial by Brett Easton Ellis and so on. And they are, um, they are experiments uh, to some extent, but they are, they are not too avant-garde. Uh, they are all quite commercial titles, uh, quite, quite mainstream. And in that way also exemplify how we see some blurring boundaries between uh, formats even at a more mainstream book market. So these, these, books are, these titles are clearly marketed as books, uh, as audiobooks, but at the same time they come close to what we would know as audio drama or even podcasts. For instance, Brad Easton Ellis uh, first narrated uh, his uh, new novel, The Shards, um, um, in his podcast, so adapting the text to the podcast format, uh, also the serial format, and then only later it came out in print uh, as a conventional novel. So these developments means that we have to consider also what an audiobook is. And I want to focus uh, for the last time here uh, on, on, um, on this one, a, a recent example uh, of this tendency to experiment with the audio format. Uh, looking into this work, the Storytel production of George Orwell's 1984 from 2022 by Anna Lee. It's described as an audio experience by Storytel. So it's kind of an audio drama. It was also nominated as the big best audio drama in, in, in the audio awards. It was a very big production. So with a global release in many different countries with different versions for each country. And it's inter an interesting case, I think, because it's a very different kind of text than the ones we usually associate with the audiobook format. So it's not plot driven. Genre fiction, it's a classic, and the way it's, adap it's adapted into sound becomes interesting both for what it does to the reading of the work, but also for a broader discussion about where audiobooks and audiobook production is going. Before moving on to say more about this, I wanted to say a few words about audio narratology as an analytical approach, for that might be of interest to some also. So narratology, of course, is put very simply, is the study of stories. Uh, the elements are the actors that create a story, and this has for many years been quite a strong field in literary studies, so a purely text-centered field of study. But for recent years, there has been an increasing awareness of the need to 
take the medium or the format into account here. So I call for a kind of a media-specific or media medium-oriented narratology. And the emergent field of audio narratology can be seen as a, as a part of that. According to Jamila Mildorf and Till Kinsel, audio narratology is an umbrella to him for a narrative approaches that take into view uh, the forms and functions of, of sound and other and their relation um, to narrative structure. So that's, of course, very broadly speaking. But we can say that most studies in this field examines the narrative functions of sound, the use of music or sound effects or voices in, for instance, audiobooks, but also audio drama or sound installations, even uh, music. So how these sound elements are used to build a story or a story world, how they can be narrative, basically, how can they have a narrative function. And then there are also studies in the representation of sound in written stories. So, for instance, in literary works, what is the narrative function of writing about sound, uh, basically? And I think both of those approaches become relevant in relation to the Orwell case, because to understand what happens in the audio version of this work, we can look at both the significance of sound in the original novel, when Orwell writes about sound, and then also what happens in the adaptation when the text is actually adapted into sound. Um, so if, if we look at this new, the audio version of 1984, it's obvious that the audiobook format has been used to kind of reinterpret the story, which is told as much in sound effects and music as in verbal narration. So in the original story, if you, if you know that, you know there's a strong emphasis on visuality. It's, we all know the phrase, Big Brother is watching you. Uh, and the symbol of the totalitarian state that is depicted in this novel is, is, uh, is a big eye. So people in the novel are kept in control through constant surveillance, uh, so-called telescreens. They are literally, literally being watched. And the eye is still there, it's still on the cover in Storytell's edition. But there's a greater emphasis on sound in this version. So not only is sound effects and music used to kind of structure and illustrate uh, the narrative, the story, but the remediation also emphasizes the significance of sound and music in the, in the story. Uh, so, so we have certain oral motives, for instance, that are already there in the original text, but which become emphasized and, and, and gets a new significance in the audio version through this uh, adaptation, through the performance and the music and so on. So, for instance, there's an old English rhyme about the church bells in London, um, which in the novel becomes a symbol of times lost, more or less something that has been forgotten in this dystopian reality. And the protagonist, he can't remember this rhyme, and he becomes quite obsessed with it. So we see that in the quote here. The half-remembered rhyme kept running through Winston's head. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clemens. You owe me the farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. So it was curious, but when you said it to yourself, you had the illusion of actually hearing the bells, the bells of a lost London that still existed somewhere or other, disguised or forgotten. Uh, and yet, so he, and he could remember he'd never heard it in real life, even though he'd, he'd never heard it in, in real life. Um, so, so the rhymes kind of makes him imagine hearing these bells. It becomes somehow symbolic of his attempt to uncover the past and, and, and also linked to this place, to London. Um, so already in the original text, we kind of have some kind of connection between the text, between the words, and the sound of the bells. But it's all imagined. He doesn't remember the bells, uh, nor does he remember the actual melody uh, of these rhymes. He only s we only get the words, uh, so to speak. And of course, when reading the novel in its original form, uh, we cannot hear the song either. So just like the protagonist, we only have the words uh, and, and we can only try to sort of guess it or, or try to remember the song. But in the audio version, we do get this melody all the time, actually. It becomes something like of an all light motif in the story, along with the sound of these bells. Uh, so it's kind of haunting the story. So it gets kind of a different function here. Instead of, of, of saying this, what it says in the quotes, we get the sound of the, the melody and the bells all the time. And looking more generally at the uses of sound representations in the novel, it seems that that songs and music and rhymes, all this become very strongly connected to the past. 
uh, to cultural memory, whereas the totalitarian state is associated with different representations of noise. Noise is being used as a tool to change minds, and we see that also in the quotes here, where noise from the telescreens is used to make people hate everything, basically. When the, um, and in the, in the audio version, that significance of the noise becomes even more pronounced, for instance, when the protagonist is being tortured towards the ending, the torture is kind of represented in the audiobook through some very loud noises, like some kind of dentist tools or something. It's it's very it's almost physically unpleasant to listen to. It's some, not something that is described in any detail in the book, but it's something that is kind of added in the audiobook. And of course, also the central theme of media surveillance is, is also communicated through sound, rather than focusing on who is watching on these telescreens. There's a lot of emphasis on, on in the audio version on who is listening, a lot of whispers and a lot of anxiety about microphones. So you might say that in, in this uh, audio version, we go from Big Brother is listening, go from Big Brother is watching to Big Brother is listening. And I could go on with the close readings here, but I want to take a few more minutes uh, towards the ending to, to move once again away from the content to the context and to say something about how the audio production of of the classic, how it fits into a broader discussion about the place of audiobooks today. So I'm sort of moving back to the publishing studies perspective here. So to market this new production of 1984, Storytel commissioned a big campaign. Uh, 2022 sounds like tw 1984 by the Swedish agency Be Real. Um, and they produced a book trailer uh, for the work. And the trailer is interesting because it reflects the way in which Storytel tries to bring audiobook um, and audio drama into a broader media context. So as the publishing scholar Simon Murray has said, um, book trailers somewhat paradoxically advertise books by presenting them in another medium. And in this case, uh, the trailer is used to highlight the relevance of Orwell's work to a visual remediation while also emphasizing the audio format. So this is how the campaign is described by Be Real. Uh, 2022 sounds like 1984 brings to life the chilling parallels between Orwell's fictional dystopia and the times we live in. The campaign is a wake-up call and an urge for everyone to open their ears and hear it for themselves. So in the trailer we see images of a modern day cityscape that is destroyed by war, so bringing to mind the war in Ukraine. But there are also references to censorship, to surveillance, uh, fake news, and so on. So that's kind of the idea in the campaign to highlight the relevance of Orwell's work and compare the 1984 of Orwell's novel to 2022. And somehow suggesting that the audio adaptation is uh, the rendering of the old work in audio format works to hi heighten this relevance. So there's a strong emphasis on notions of listening and sound and hearing. We see that. Uh, the trailer urges us to listen and to hear it, and then we get the title 2022 sounds like 1984. And at the same time, there's a strong orientation towards the logics of television and film. So they note how they wanted to make something that feel, felt less like a typical ad for an audiobook uh, or an audiobook service and more like a blockbuster trainer for, trailer for a must see piece of entertainment. And this is something they mentioned a lot at Storytel this ambition to bring audiobooks into the broader media landscape and compete with other entertainment industries. So there's a strong orientation towards the logics of film and television and towards a broader mediascape, but also with a, with a recognition that it's important to stress the specificity of the audio format. So in a way, using the trailer to market the audio format as much as the work itself. And then we also get uh, this in the marketing campaign, Big Brother is not watching you, which is interesting because uh, in, this, in, in this way the marketing campaign for Orwell's book uh, reactualizing -actualize, re 1984 in an age of surveillance, it also becomes a way for Storytel to f make an ethical stance and reflect on their own role as a, as a streaming platform in a surveillance culture stating how they do not use cookies to track the listeners' actions or trace personal data. So that's, of course, contrary to many other similar platforms. And of course, while they might not use personal data, they do of, 
do they do they do trace their listeners uh, and use data on listening behavior to to make book recommendations and and produce new stories um, i could discuss that at length also but that is of course more of a, a pu publishing sp uh, perspective again but the main idea here is that the audio version of 1984 is used to reinterpret the story so the literary classic reflecting on the significant uh, so reflecting on the significance of, and s of of sound and noise in the original story so it kind of adds to our uh, understanding of the work and that would be more of a literary studies perspective so while also somehow reflecting a broader turn towards orality and sound in contemporary culture. And then it also says something about the place of audiobooks in a broader media landscape. So the marketing campaign uh, and the fact that Storytel focuses on producing this classic reflects an ambition to experiment with the format. They want to move beyond established ideas about audiobooks and gain some cultural capital. Uh, with a production which at once seems to strengthen their link to literary culture, to literary tradition, and also point toward a future where book production becomes thoroughly transmedial, marketing a classic as if it was, it was a Hollywood blockbuster. And in that way also marketing storytell, marketing the audio format as much as the work itself. And some more general conclusions. So what I wanted to to say with this lecture has to do with how the audio format and the, and the audio book can be connected to changes in the way we read and use and experience literature, as well as changes in the actual content. And these developments become connected to the medial affordances of the format, uh, its mobility, which, which uh, first and foremost has to do with how we listen on the go in everyday life, as well as the mediation through sound, which has more to do with the context, with the text themselves. I think moving forward, it would be interesting to study more closely how text and sound is combined in a specific, um, in specific text, and also how these new hybrid texts um, impact the listener experiences. And of course, we may also discuss what these developments mean for how we define audiobooks and literature, leading to blurring boundaries between the between formats and art forms. So, thanks for listening. <laughs>